Uh, John chapter 5 is where we're going to be this morning. If you have your copy of God's Word, go ahead and fire it open right now. John chapter 5, starting in verse 30. Uh, Sure glad that you're here worshiping the Lord with us this morning. If you're a mom or a grandma or even a great-grandma, we just want to say happy Mother's Day to you. We're so grateful for the gift that you are in our lives. And we also acknowledge on this Mother's Day that there are surely some who are here this morning for whom this is a more painful day. Maybe there are children you're estranged from or the children who are now with the Lord or maybe you've been trying to have children and it's just been a difficult journey. And and if that's your story, we just want to say to you that the Lord loves you and we love you as well. Well, we're excited to dive into John chapter 5 as we continue our study through John's gospel. Uh, But this morning, I actually want to begin with a confession. So I'm going to trust that this is a safe place where I can unburden myself to you and just let you know what really happened in my life. So we good with that? Okay, here's the deal. Last fall, I lied to the police. I wasn't planning to, wasn't really trying to. It's more a fact that I'm stupid, but it happened. Some of you are like, okay, pastor, you're going to have to kind of give us that story. Okay, so you guys know that I like to ride my bike, right? Like every day I do my 25-mile bike ride, and I kind of have the same route that I go every day. So this was actually on a Sunday, the Lord's Day, that I became a liar last fall. But I was doing my bike ride in the afternoon. I was headed up County Road 4, and there was a dirt road off to the side, and I noticed a bunch of police vehicles with their lights on, and that clearly something was going down, and I just, you know, decided to mind my own business and keep going, and so I turned when County Road 4 dead-ended, and you know, I, I usually go down that road past Big Swan Lake, and there are a few curves right before the lake, and I remember this day very clearly because there was a guy on a motorcycle, and, and you know those guys that like want to have a Harley, but don't have a Harley, but you know, every time they pass you, it's like super obnoxious and they're trying to prove some point about their masculinity. And so I remember this dude and he comes like, you know, just right past me and he's blowing his smoke right in my face. And I'm like, this is not a great day. And as soon as that happens, I get past the lake and then the, the, this, this police officer turns his lights on and pulls me over on my bike. Like, I've never been pulled over on my bicycle before. And I'm sitting there thinking, like, I'm not speeding. Like, I go fast, but not that fast. And so I'm I'm trying to figure out what's going on. And he's like, hey, you know, a few miles back, we had this incident. I'm like, yeah, I kind of saw those cars there. He's like, well, there was a guy, and he fled on his dirt bike, and we're trying to, to find him. He's like, have you seen anybody fleeing on a dirt bike? And I'm like, no, sorry. And... He kind of gives me this weird, like, quizzical look, and okay, thanks. And he gets back in his car, and he drives away. And I'm going about a half mile farther down the road, and then it hits me. That dork on the motorcycle, that wasn't a motorcycle. See, I'm a city boy, and I don't know the difference between a dirt bike and a motorcycle. And so that was the guy they were looking for, that I just told them I'd not seen. So yes, I'm a moron. In fact, I'm a terrible witness. That's actually the theme of this passage in John chapter 5. When a crime happens, the testimony of a witness can prove vital. At a trial, the words of a witness can change the outcome. Witnesses are incredibly important. In John chapter 5, The final section of this chapter, Jesus is on trial. It's not a formal trial. It's an informal trial. But let me kind of sketch for you the outline of John chapter 5. Here's the setup. Verse 18 was the charge that they were laying against Jesus. And the charge was, you've committed blasphemy by making yourself equal with God. Last week, we talked about how Jesus' worth proves that he's worthy of worship. Those were words from Jesus' lips. And that was actually like Jesus' opening statement in this trial that was happening. So Jesus has faced the charge. He's 
given his opening statement, and now he's going to summon witnesses. These last 18 verses of the chapter, Jesus will summon five witnesses to show that he's telling the truth about his identity as he defends himself against these blasphemy charges. And that leads to this main point. Believe the witnesses that testify to Jesus's worth. So we're going to listen in on the testimony of five witnesses this morning. And there'll be a special twist in the trial that comes near the end. But before we get to the five witnesses, there's a couple verses of introduction. And the introduction gives us this point that there's a need for witnesses. Let's look at these first two verses. Starting in verse 30, Jesus says, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. And now that word translated true here in this passage could probably better be rendered valid. And what Jesus is saying is, if a person gives testimony about themselves, will you have reason to be dubious about that claim? And Jesus is actually referring to a legal principle that was outlined in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 19 and verse 15. And in Deuteronomy 19, we read this, A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. So there was a principle in prosecution in the Old Testament that multiple witnesses are more likely to establish the truth of what really happened. And then and, and that makes sense, right? Because a single witness, like me, can be confused or mistaken. But multiple witnesses are likely to put together an airtight case about what's really going down. And so Jesus is saying, if the only witness you have is one person talking about who they are, you have reason to doubt that claim. But if you have many people backing up the testimony, it's likely to be true. And so Jesus is like, I got five witnesses for you. And he begins summoning his witnesses. Let's examine these witnesses right along with the crowd. Here's the first witness, John the Baptist. And Jesus says, verse 32, there's another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from humanity, but I say these things so that you may be saved. And John was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. Uh, so Jesus compares John the Baptist to a lamp. Now, the lamps that they had in that culture weren't like lamps that we have in our culture. You couldn't just turn the bulb on and the electricity would go for hours and hours and days and months. No, they had handheld lamps. They functioned almost like flashlights. You would pour fuel into the lamp. Think of like the opening in like an Aladdin style lamp and you'd pour the fuel into that lamp and then you would ignite it and that would provide a flame that would illuminate and you would carry it around so that you could see where you were going. But here's the thing about those lamps, the fuel burned super fast. And so when Jesus said that John was like a lamp, what he was saying was like he was a thing for a while and you all saw him and you all noticed him, but then it was gone quickly. You could say that John lived his life like a candle in the wind. And his lamp burned out long before his legend ever did. And that's actually the point Jesus was making. Like, you guys remember this legend, uh, this stuff about John the Baptist and what he testified to you. Like, can you remember stuff that was popular even like two or three years ago? Like masks or Tiger King and it was all the rage for just a moment, and now it's gone. But you can think back, in some cases, with fond memories about stuff from a few years ago. And Jesus is saying, think back fondly on John the Baptist because you sure loved him at the time. In fact, Jesus is alluding to a passage from Psalm chapter 132 here. There's two words from Psalm 132 that get repeated in this passage. Super interesting. And check this out. Her priests I will clothe with salvation, and her saints will shout for joy. There I will make a horn to sprout for David. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. 
So the anointed is the Messiah, right? And there's going to be a lamp who comes to prepare the way to point to, to put the spotlight on the Messiah. And the same Greek word that the translators of the Old Testament used in Psalm 132 is the word that John uses in his gospel to discuss John the Baptist. And so John the Baptist was a lamp putting the light on Jesus. And in verse 16 of the psalm, it said, your people will shout for joy. That's the same word that when Jesus says, you rejoiced about John the Baptist for a while. You were so fired up about him. And Jesus said, you liked him so much. Why don't you listen to or remember the testimony that he gave? Well, what was the testimony that John the Baptist gave about Jesus? Well, back in John chapter one, do you remember? When John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. He said, there's one coming after me, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is saying, you might not believe my testimony, but you love John, so will you give his testimony another chance based on your love for him? So actually in this passage, there's two things happening. Like on the surface, there's a surface level meaning. That's the first thing that's happening. There is a historical situation where Jesus had an informal trial in front of a bunch of Jewish religious leaders. It was a true thing. It actually happened. But there's a spiritual, deeper meaning. And that's the second thing going on in this passage. See, the question that John wants us to ask is not, what will a bunch of religious dudes decide about Jesus? Religious guys who've been in the ground for hundreds and hundreds of years at this point. No, no, no. Remember why John wrote his gospel? He tells us at the very end. He says, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so the question isn't necessarily, what will these people decide about Jesus? The question is, what will you decide about Jesus? Well, who do you believe that Jesus is? Do you believe Jesus' testimony? And so if we take this first witness, the principle is, John the Baptist was somebody you really loved, so re-examine the evidence about Jesus because of your love for John the Baptist. Well, I'm guessing that none of you went and hung out and listened to John the Baptist, but there might be somebody in your life who told you about Jesus and maybe you've walked away for a season. Maybe your face really on the fritz right now or you're not sure what you even believe. But is there somebody that you deeply care about who talked to you about Jesus and you could say, because of my appreciation and love for this person, I'd be willing to give the gospel another hearing. Maybe it's an old youth pastor. Maybe it's a high school friend. Maybe it was somebody in your family. I think about what Paul said to Timothy about the faith that his mother and his grandmother had demonstrated. And maybe you have a grandparent or a family member who was just so instrumental in pointing you towards Jesus. And you would give that evidence another evaluation because of your love for that person. Well, that's the first witness, but the witnesses are just getting started the second witness is now called to the scene, and this witness is not a person. This witness is more of a thing. It's Jesus' miracles, verse 36. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. Jesus' works are more important than the words that were spoken about him by the forerunner. Uh, for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And Jesus did God's works. So you can believe what Jesus said. Like the point of Jesus' miracles was not so you could be super excited about Jesus the miracle man. Like think about all the healings Jesus did. Every person Jesus ever healed is dead and in the ground right now. The point of the healing was not that they would be healed forever and for always. No. Many of those people have faith in him. They'll be resurrected to eternal life when Jesus returns. But the point was not that their healing would be a perpetual witness to how awesome Jesus the healer is. The point is that Jesus's miracles would open our ears so that we would listen to the gospel that he was sharing. And this is what the apostles said when they shared the faith in Acts chapter two. And this was what Peter said when he was giving that first sermon First day the church existed, 3,000 people got saved. Check this out. Peter said, men of Israel, 
Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. Now you might be asking, don't other people do miraculous things? Don't even fake prophets do miraculous things? In fact, didn't Pharaoh's magic men mimic Moses' miracles? Well, yes, they did. But there was something unique about Jesus' miracles. And Jesus' miracles all fulfilled the hopes and the prophecies of the Old Testament. See, in the Old Testament, it said, this is what the new creation era will look like. And Jesus came and did miracles that brought that new creation into reality in preview form. The blind began to see. The deaf began to hear. The mute began to speak, the lame began to walk, the sick were healed, the dead were raised. All of these things that were promised in the Old Testament were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And when you see a miracle, man, that grows your faith. Have you seen a miracle that's grown your faith? I was talking to my dad. I called him for his birthday. My, my dad was born on Star Wars Day, uh, May the 4th. And so a couple weeks ago, I was on, on the phone with my dad, uh, you know, doing the, the birthday call. And as we were talking, he said, he said, hey, Dale, have you talked to the, your church? Hey, have you in a sermon used as an illustration the doorknob story? And I'm like, not sure if I have. He's like, you got to do it. You got to do it. Like, this is one of those stories that our family, this happened like almost 30 years ago, but it's meant so much to our family. So here's the story. I was in junior high and uh, my family was friends with another family. And that family was doing some ministry stuff that, that I was involved in. And so at the end of the summer, as a way of saying thank you to that family, we wanted to buy them a gift. And we weren't sure what to buy them. We wanted to do something a little bit nicer than like an Applebee's gift card. And so my my parents got this idea. So you see, this family that we were connected with, they uh, they just built a new house. And and they built a new house. They were super excited about it. But they were a huge family. It was a family with like six or seven kids. I mean, totally like would have fit in in Cocado. But they were from Ohio. And so they, they have this new house and they were a large family living off one single income. Like dad was a teacher at the local school. And so because they were just this large family with one income, they took a few shortcuts in building their home. And one of the things that they didn't feel like they could afford and they they would do without was doorknobs on their interior doors. And so like every bedroom door, you could just kind of like crouch down and look right in. And so my parents were like, maybe we can do something to fix that. So my parents were garage selling in our neighborhood, and we lived in this cool neighborhood where a bunch of new houses were getting built at the time. And there was a house in our neighborhood that was pretty new. It was just a couple years old. But they decided to upgrade from their really nice doorknobs to, like, ultra nice doorknobs. And so they were selling all their used doorknobs super cheap. And so my dad's like, you know what? We can buy these doorknobs, and they can put them in their house. And so he went and he bought all their doorknobs. The other family installs them. A few weeks later, we see them and they're just like, thank you. Like, this is such a wonderful thing. Like it was like, we didn't realize how annoying it was to live without doorknobs until we had doorknobs. And they're like, every door in our house, like 15 doors, we've got doorknobs on all of them. Thank you. And that kind of struck my dad. And he's like, wait, 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 how many doors? Like 15. He's like, wait, you know, my dad's one of those guys that's super meticulous about how he spends his money and writes everything down. And he looked, I only paid for 14 doorknobs. So, you know, being the type of ethical guy that my dad is, he immediately goes to our neighbor's house and he's like, hey, you know, I got 15 doorknobs from you. I only paid for 14. I owe you four more dollars for that last doorknob. And he's like, got his checkbook out to write a check for four dollars because that was like a bigger thing in the 90s, I guess. Four dollars now is nothing. But the lady just looks at him and she goes, she goes, we only have 14 doors in our house. She goes, and I counted those doorknobs three times before I put them out in the garage sale. She's like, I promise you, there were only 14 doorknobs. And my dad just like has this moment. He's like, yeah, I know there's 15 doorknobs in that house. 
and you're swearing to me that there's only 14 doorknobs, and where did that extra doorknob come from? If so, like for the last 28 years, our family has believed that God did something to provide for a family in need to show his love for him. Because, like, if you knew our neighbor, like, that's not the kind of person that would promise you that she counted wrong and insist and insist and insist. And it's just been a faith-building, faith-growing thing for us. And that's what Jesus is saying. And Jesus is saying, don't believe just because you love the idea that Jesus can do miracles. Allow the love that Jesus shows for his people to drive you to the gospel where his love is revealed in its deepest and truest form. That's witness number two. Here's witness number three. Uh, God the Father, verse 37 and the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you've never heard, his form you've never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. How is God the Father a witness to Jesus Christ? Well, Jesus is actually building a fairly complex argument here. He's actually building off a verse in Deuteronomy. Here's what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 12. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. This is talking about when Moses was up on the mountain receiving the law. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form. Uh, There was only a voice. So notice Jesus, in those verses we just read, gave three negatives. He said, you, the people of Israel, have not done any of these three things. You have not heard his voice, you have not seen his form, and you do not have his words in you. Yeah, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 12 is super clear. Like, Israel's ancestors did two of those three things. They heard his voice, they had his word. The only thing they didn't do was see his form. So how does it work out that the Old Testament's like, you've done two of these three things, and Jesus is like, you've done none of these three things, God is the witness. Well, here's the argument, and this is how Bible scholar Craig Keener explains it. Uh, Jesus denies that those who reject him have ever truly accepted the revelation of the law on Mount Sinai. They reject the new Torah, Jesus, the word of God, who's among them. One only hears the voice of the Father if one has heard the life-giving voice of the Son. See, Jesus is blowing up the religious leader's argument that they have a God faith, but not a Jesus faith. And Jesus is saying, you can't have a God the Father faith and not a God the Son Jesus faith. Because if you refuse to listen to the voice of the Son, you've never truly heard the voice of the Father. Because the Father loves the Son and speaks through the Son. And man, if you're a parent, doesn't, don't, don't you resonate with that argument? Like if somebody comes to you and they're like, I trust you, but I don't trust your kid at all. Like, unless you have one of those kids that you know shouldn't be trusted, like, most parents with most kids are like, dude, if you don't trust my kid, don't tell me that you trust me, because I and my child think the same way and are saying the same things. And how airtight is that relationship between God the Father and God the Son, who are of the same essence, both in the same trinity? So Jesus says to them, God the Father is witnessing that you don't believe because you reject God the Son. And that leads to the fourth witness, which are the scriptures themselves. Check it out, verse 39. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is they that bear witness about me. You refuse to come to me that you may have life. It's another kind of complex argument about the Bible. Here's how D.A. Carson breaks it down in his commentary. Uh, The failure of the Jewish people is not disobeying this or that command, this or that provision of the Old Testament covenant, but their failure to understand the law covenant in the first place. They take the law covenant as an end in itself, the final epitome of right religion, and not as Jesus insists it was, a witness to Christ himself. A scrupulous adherence to the law brings people to hope for salvation in the law itself and to reject the Messiah to whom the law pointed, then the law itself and its human author Moses must stand up in outraged accusation. 
So Jesus is talking, and this is pretty cool, right? He's talking to some people who really, really knew the Old Testament. I mean, these are people who memorized, like, books of the Old Testament. These are people who dedicated their entire life to understanding the argument of the Old Testament. And Jesus says to them, hey, by the way, you don't understand the Old Testament at all. And they're like, you're telling me I don't understand it. I've studied it, and I've studied it, and I've studied it. And she's like, you totally missed the point. How so? Because they missed that the Old Testament is about Jesus. Now, let me say this. We don't worship the Bible. The Trinity is not the Father, the Son, and the Holy Bible. The Bible is not divine. The Bible points us to the one who is divine. The Bible is not God. It points us to the one who is God. So the purpose of the Bible, its functional value, is to communicate God's message to us so that we can worship Jesus. Every page of Scripture points to Jesus. Every story is a sign pointing to Jesus. Every passage whispers his name. But to these erudite, arrogant Bible experts, Jesus says, you've made two errors in reading the Old Testament. One error is intellectual, and the other error is applicational. Let me break down each of them. What's the intellectual error that they've made in reading scripture. It's interesting how this has recurred in our day. So there's a train of thought among people who study the Old Testament that we shouldn't actually call it the Old Testament. Maybe we should call it the First Testament, or more prominently, you hear scholars say we should refer to it as the Hebrew Bible, because it came from Jewish people It's the only Bible of the Jewish people, and it is cultural appropriation for us to take the Jewish Bible and not let Jewish people tell us how to interpret it, which in our culture sounds like a pretty strong argument. That's actually the argument that these people would have made to Jesus. This is our Jewish Bible. We'll tell you, as Jewish people who received it, how to interpret it. So what's the, what's the error here? The error is the Old Testament must be interpreted literally as the Jewish first audience, the first people who read it after it was written, would have understood it. The right meaning must be the surface meaning that the first readers would have picked up when they read the text. There can be no deeper meaning. There can be no spiritual meaning. There can be no meaning that is not revealed until Jesus points it out. Well, Jesus blew up that way of interpreting the Bible. Right here in John chapter 5, he says, these are the scriptures that testify about me. Well, let me give you another example. In Luke chapter 24, Remember Jesus, uh, he'd just been resurrected and he was walking on the road with a few of his disciples who were all torn up because they thought their hopes and dreams were dashed because the Messiah had been crucified. So they were headed back on a road to Emmaus, their hometown, and they're all sulking like, what are we going to do now? We just wasted all these years of our life. And Jesus shows up and he starts walking with them like a stranger and they don't recognize him. And so they're having a theological conversation about what, what just went down. And Jesus says to them, verse 25 of Luke 24, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Here's the key verse, Luke 24, 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Like the scriptures are about Jesus Christ, even if the first audience thought they were about something else. See, there's this train of thought that we must let the first audience determine the actual meaning of Scripture. Now, if you're a theology nerd, I'm going to theology nerd out for like 30 seconds here. There's a school of thought called dispensationalism, and it says that the literal meaning, as the first audience understood it, must be the actual meaning of the text. So here's how the Jewish people understood the surface meaning of the text. 
all the promises and predictions of the Old Testament said that the ethnic, national, political Israel, that little sliver of land just to the east of the Mediterranean Sea, that Israel would be restored by God to international prominence, to great, uh, fruitful uh, produce, to a place where the world would see the greatness of Israel. Like Israel was the pinnacle of God's plan, and eventually God would make Israel great again. And that's what the religious leaders at the time of Jesus were looking for. They're like, we've read the prophecies, we've read the prophecies. God's going to make Israel great. And Jesus shows up, and here's what Jesus says. Jesus said, the prophecies that you read were not about one geopolitical ethnic nation. The promises were about what God was going to do to raise up a true people of Israel from every tongue and every tribe and every nation, so the worldwide glory of God would be expanded as people from every place put their faith in the one who is the true king of Israel, the one who fulfilled the true destiny of Israel, Jesus Christ. And every scripture points not to Israel being glorified, but to Jesus, the true Israel, being glorified. And those who are united to Jesus Christ will join the true Israel people of God and be part of the new creation that Jesus is bringing about. Jesus looks at those people and he says, y'all have misread your Bible. For all these years, you've misread your Bible. You've thought your Bible was about you and how God was going to make you great. But the Bible is about how Jesus is great and only by being in him can you be great. That is the intellectual error that they made in reading their Bible. But even more striking is the applicational error that they made in reading their Bible. And you see it in verse 40. You refuse to come to me that you might have life. Jesus said, here's how you read your Bible wrongly. You read it and you reject its implications. Jesus said, you don't just have a mind problem. You have a heart problem. You have a heart that wants to do its own thing. You have a heart that believes that you know better than God. If God says Jesus is the focal point of my plan for the ages, you're like, hey, God, I I got a better plan. I got a better plan for how my life can work out. I got a better plan for how I can find fulfillment. God, um, you say that you're the door, and anyone who enters through the door can have eternal life, but uh, I got a better door to find happiness. Uh, You say that you're a well of living water, but I'm going to go dig my own well and find my own water because I kind of trust myself to find a water source. And you say you're the bread of life, but I'm going to go find my own food and my own sustenance. And you say that everything is found in you, but, you know, I kind of believe that I can figure out where to find what I need. We have these hard hearts that reject Jesus because we believe that we know what we need. Well, this brings us to the twist in the story. I said near the end of the trial, there was a twist. It's pretty fascinating. Here's what happens. I want you to picture this. Picture that you're in a courtroom. I can't imagine this ever happening in America, but it would be fascinating. Here's Jesus sitting as the defendant. And he stands up and he looks at the prosecutor. He's like, hey, dude, switch spots. Jesus shifts from being the defendant to being the prosecutor. Because the world puts Jesus on trial. But Jesus' answer is actually to put our hearts on trial. And we find that we're the ones who are being examined. What a scene. Verse 41, Jesus exposes their motives. I do not receive glory from people, he said, to a group of people who are constantly looking for others to affirm them and giving them worth and value. Verse 42, Jesus exposes their hearts, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. You're looking for your own 
value. You're looking to your own desires. You believe you have all the answers. In verse 43, Jesus exposes their gullibility. I have come in my Father's name, and you don't believe me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. Like you refuse to believe Jesus, but when some pretender putz comes along, you're going to believe him because he's telling you exactly what you want to hear, and you can't discern truth. You just go after what you think is going to make you happy. See, isn't that what our hearts do? Don't we believe that at the end of the day, we pretty much know how to run the universe? And we don't need a God to tell us how to be. We just need a God to do the stuff we can't do so that what we already know should happen can actually happen. So we view God as a tool that makes my will for the universe happen because I got a pretty good plan for the universe. And just like, you got a terrible plan for the universe. But you got to acknowledge that you need Jesus and not your own intellect, your own desires, your own goals, your own plans. So Jesus just calls them all out. And then he summons the fifth and final witness. And that's Moses. i got to explain to you why this matters so much. Uh, the Jewish people remembered about Moses, what happened back in Exodus chapter 34. Do you remember that story? So Moses had gone up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, the tablets from God, and he took a while. And the people were like, hey, Moses, this is taking a while. Are you ever going to come down from the mountain? And he still didn't come down from the mountain. He still didn't come down from the mountain. And the people eventually decided, you know what? It's a God problem. Like, Moses is never coming back. And so since they decided that Moses disappeared and it was a God problem, they decided that, you know, the, the best answer would be to make new gods. And so they had a jewelry collection and everybody turned in their gold rings and bracelets and watches and they melted them all down and out of their gold jewelry, they made a cow. And then they started bowing down and worshiping the cow. And then Moses actually does return with the Ten Commandments from God on two tablets, one in each hand. And remember, Moses comes down to camp, and they're all just like, holy cow, holy cow. And, and Moses is like, holy cow. And he smashes the tablets, right? You remember that story? And, and it was a real problem. And God is up in heaven, and he's like, um, I'm done with them. God says to Moses, I'm just going to zap those people, those rebellious people, and from you and your descendants, we're going to have a do-over. I'm going to make a new people from your line. And do you remember Moses prayed to God and he interceded for the people? And he's, God, he's like, God, for the, for the sake of your glory and your fame and your reputation among the earth, don't destroy your people. If you do, they're going to say, God took his people out of Egypt, out of slavery, just to kill them here. And God spared his people because of Moses interceding for them. You remember that? And so there was a thought developed among the Jewish people that Moses had now become their permanent advocate or intercessor before God. And so what Moses had done with the cow incident, he was now doing forever in heaven to plead with God on their behalf. So like, we got Moses, we got Moses. He's, you know, begging our case before God. And so Jesus is like, um, yo, the faith hero that you believed would always defend you and have your back is actually the one accusing you. We're ready to read the last few verses, verse 44. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and don't seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, the one on whom you've set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you don't believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Jesus said, why do you think Moses has your back? Moses is the one who's accusing you. And you know why Moses is accusing you, Jesus said? Because you missed the whole point of everything that Moses wrote. Everything Moses wrote was pointing to Jesus. Now, if you think about what Moses wrote, the first five books of the Old Testament are what we attribute to Moses, the Torah, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Think about how what Moses wrote points to Jesus. Now, you're like, the word Jesus never appears in those five books. True story. But there are so many signs, so many pictures of Jesus promised in what Moses wrote. Think about Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when the curses were being doled out after the sin in Eden. God said to the snake, you will strike at the heel 
of the descendant of the woman. But he's going to smash your head. Man, that was a prediction of what Jesus Christ was going to do to Satan on the cross. In Numbers chapter 24, I see him, but not now. I, I behold him, but not yet. The bright morning star, the star of Jacob is coming. That was Jesus Christ. Moses wrote in Deuteronomy chapter 18, right before they went into the promised land, when he was about to disappear from the scene, there will be another prophet like me raised up from among your own people. And Jesus was the promised prophet that Moses predicted. Oh, we could go on and on. Those are just a few of the pictures. We could talk about how Jesus is the ram who was sacrificed. Remember when Abraham and Isaac went up on the mountain and Abraham was about to kill his own son, but God provided the substitute animal and Jesus is the ram. The son of man was not spared so that the sons of man could be spared. Jesus was the Passover lamb, that if his blood is painted on the doorpost of your heart, the angel of death will pass right over and you can have eternal life. Jesus is the one who leads you through the chaotic waters of judgment, just as the Red Sea was parted. Jesus is the bread of life, like the manna that came down in the desert. On and on we could go. And Jesus says to them, everything Moses wrote was about me. Well, the story started with Jesus on trial, but it ends with us on trial. And the question rings out, will you believe these witnesses about Jesus? God spoke through his son. He's provided provision for eternal life. Will you believe what Jesus has said? Our culture says salvation is found in all types of different places. Our culture says salvation is found in finding the right person with whom you can have a romantic relationship that they can fulfill you forever. Our culture says salvation is found in discovering and living out your true inner identity, whatever that is. Our culture says that salvation is found in creating your own glory by becoming worthy of fame or worthy of success or worthy of riches. And Jesus comes along and says, salvation is found by realizing that you are not worthy, but worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the one who takes your sin as his own, who dies the death you should have died on the cross, unites you with him in that death so that you could be united with him in resurrection to new and eternal life. The Bible says if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. That's the question. Have you believed in Jesus Christ? It's more than just hearing the story. It's about building your life on him. Committing everything to him. Jesus, I, I give you everything I am. I unite myself by faith fully with you. Jesus, if you're not who you say you are, I've wasted everything. But if you are who you say you are, I've gained everything. And lost nothing. I've staked my, my eternity on the identity of Jesus Christ as he's revealed it and as the witnesses have testified to it. Do you believe? Lord Jesus, make us those who believe. In this moment, help our unbelief. If there are people here, Lord, who need to be united with you by faith, Lord, right now I ask, that they would put their faith in Jesus. That they would build their life on you. That they would say, Jesus, I give you my sin and my past. I give you everything I've, I've been. That you might let it die with you on the cross. That I might become united with you. And my identity is, is you and only you. Lord, I, I put my faith in Jesus that I would be found in Jesus, known as a Jesus person, a Christian. 
Lord, for all of us, I pray that we would believe the gospel deeper, more fully, embrace Jesus more deeply, yield ourselves more completely. We build our lives on you because you are one.